Hello, my name is Marcus. I'm the compiler of a collection of therapy quotes entitled 1001 Windmills of the Mind. This is a collection of quotes taken from the so-called psychodynamic or the psychoanalytic perspective, which long ago used to be called philosophical medicine. These are quotes that try to address acknowledge, witness uh, our past. Um, we're trying to heal from memories. If there are painful memories, uh, a lot of our life force is uh, sent into those memories. Uh, and the theory is they influence how we s see the present. We, can, we may distort the present in relation to those traumatic memories. Uh, with the hope with the positive intention of trying to be our own caring witness. So if we project something from our past into the present, that's like creating a mirror. Right? We look in the mirror and then we have an idea about our childhood past and then we can be our own caring witness. So these quotes are helping us to be our own caring witness. Grief is healed when it's witnessed by a caring other and these quotes are helping us with the knowledge to do so. Um, another metaphor is that uh, these quotes are helping us to be our own egg extensional detective, to make the links between what's going on in the present, when it started in the past, to notice the pattern, and then to see it in the here and now. Right? Um, these quotes are helping us to unpick the threads of a traumatic script and then use those threads to weave a new, healthier, script. Um, man's main task is to give psychological birth to himself if he didn't get it naturally by the age of three with a, with a secure attachment style. So the theory is that, um, that the psychological birth of the child doesn't automatically take place with the biological birth. That there's this um, process that takes place which Mahler calls the separation individuation process with various subphases. Right? Um, so when the baby's born, he needs an extended womb. That's called stage of social symbiosis. Right? Humans come out too early, so babies need this extended womb. It's like a the metaphor is it's like a psychological egg, and this psychological egg or stage of social symbiosis or the stage of undifferentiation or the stage of fusion, the stage where the child still thinks basically he's kind of like in the womb, although he recognizes. I mean, to some degree, that his mother's outward, but he still thinks in the womb in terms of his needs. So he needs to get his needs automatically met, right? Just like in the physical womb, his needs got automatically met. In the extended womb, because humans come out too early, likewise, his needs need to be um, to get automatically met through the attunement uh, with the mother. And the child thinks that the mother is sort of there for him. Right? Just like when he was in the womb, the environment was there for him. It's all about him. Uh, the child has what's called a hallucinatory uh, omnipotence, um, unconditional omnipotence. Hallucinatory, unconditional omnipotence. He doesn't even have to think about that he has a need. It just gets met automatically. In the extended womb, uh, this continues. It switches over into omnipotence of thought. Now the child thinks that, yeah, he gets that maybe he's hungry. He makes a gesture. That leads to omnipotence of gesture. So he still thinks it's all about him, whether it's whether his needs get met automatically, unconditionally, uh, whether he has a thought and then the mother's attuned and his needs get met, or whether he shakes his rattle and the mother responds or makes some other gesture. Right. Um, so this um, period from biological birth to roughly four to five months is called the stage of the extended womb or the stage of social symbiosis. Right. Um, this is a key uh, um, thread in this series, this uh, what goes on about what goes on, what's uh, various aspects of this uh, period. Because one theory is if the child doesn't get his symbiotic needs met, if he doesn't enter into this egg, or if he's prematurely ejected out of that egg, um, or um, 
then he doesn't really have the, the nourishment to hatch out of it, to reach a psychological birth. So that egg is just as important uh, for the psychological birth as is or as was the physical womb egg life for the biological birth. So in the uterus, the child is nurtured, he feels safe, he grows, he has basic trust, he wants to come out. That's the biological natural order for him to be biologically born. Right. Now he enters into the psychological egg. And likewise, if he's nourished and he feels safe and he achieve and he receives basic trust, if he gets his needs met, he feels trust and loved, he feels safe enough to follow that natural, innate, biological drive to differentiate from the mother, which takes place between three and seven months, depending on the author. Mahler says on average it's between four and five months. All right. Um, so the theory is if the child doesn't get his needs met, um, um, he can't hatch out because he didn't get his needs met. So he's he has a trauma there. Now, the child will be very angry around that. And then his uh, he may grow up with what's called the hostile provocative attachment style, um, where all he thinks about is uh, he's got to get someone else to fuse with. Now, now no one can now no no other person in the future can be the mother and provide an optimal symbiosis, a positive symbiosis. So the person thinks, well, the next best thing is 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 well, if he can get a lackey to form a, a negative symbiosis with them. They don't like it, but they're afraid and they're gonna be at the person's beck and call kind of thing. So in other words, the baby would rather have a negative symbiosis with the mother and be stuck there than not have any symbiosis. Um, so, so a person with the hostile provocative attachment style, the bully pattern, okay, their, their main, their life force, their philosophy in life is power and control. They wanna, exert power over others and have them under their control because they want to frighten the other person uh, so that they feel that they have to respond to their wishes and whims and needs because they didn't get it as a baby so they're trying to recreate that now it can't be done no per no lackey uh, can provide uh, positive symbiosis so he's stuck there so and then if the lackey leaves he'll look for another lackey kind of thing and he's stuck there. He he can't uh, get his positive symbiotic needs met. It's impossible. That's a one-time deal. Right? From four to from birth to four to five months, that's a one-time deal. That it can never be replicated. But the person with the bully pattern, he's trying to replicate it. He's trying to master that trauma of not getting his egg needs met. So that's sort of his positive intention. Now it's, Bergler says it's much better to think of it as a communication. It's a mirror. That behavior is a mirror for him to look at and see that he didn't get his symbiotic needs met. Right? Um, and then you work through the mourning process that way. So either we repeat and don't remember like Sisyphus and repeat and don't remember or we um, look in the mirror of our behavior and then talk about it and mourn. Um, so the baby needs to get his symbiotic needs met. Um, yeah, and by the way, the main philosophy of those with the hostile provocative attachment style, it's all about survival, power and control. Uh, splitting is very strong. Either you use, either other people are useful for him, uh, or uh, he's reminded of how he didn't get his needs met, so they're very uh, unwant, strongly unwanted, because he's still looking for good, the good mother breast. He's, he's still looking for the good breast mother through symbolically through another person but that other person can't be the good breast mother for him so that behavior of being hostile and provocative trying to force someone to fuse with them um, that's a mirror for him to see that he didn't get his symbiotic needs met or that he was prematurely ejected out of the symbiotic egg the child has to naturally um, hatch out of that egg on his own accord so the, the observation is it takes place between three and seven months depending on the, the child and the situation right he, he shouldn't be prematurely ejected out right? um, so let's say um, the child does get his symbiotic needs met meaning that the mother's there for the baby um, you know one suggestion is maybe the mothers should just stay in bed for the first five months let's say 
and the baby sleeps on the mother, or right, has constant contact with the mother, uh, skin to skin contact, and um, that that way the baby still thinks he's in the womb. That helps the mother to be attuned to the baby's needs, right? um, and then he feels safe enough to differentiate. Then at five months or six months, he, he starts to uh, begin the hatching out process. Now, when the child leaves the egg, okay, he's beginning the differentiation process. Now, this hatching out process is gradual. Unlike the biological birth where the hatching out took place in a couple of seconds, for the psychological birth, the hatching out of the psychological egg is gradual. It takes over two and a half years. So the child begins the hatching out process. So now when he begins the hatching out process, uh, uh, so let's say from five months to fifteen months. That's the first. That's the next sub phase. It's called this. That's called differentiation. Um, now during that sub phase, um, the child has mobility. He can crawl around, run around, but psychologically he still thinks everything around him is all about him. So the primary narcissism, narcissism, where he thinks everything is there to serve him, it's all that's still there. But that's okay. That's natural. What the mother does is she offers a mirroring, they say. Uh, means the child sees that the mother, that when the mother looks at the child, that she, that the child sees that she ex is, accepts him. And he feels okay and he builds self-esteem. Now when he builds natural, accept, feels accepted like that, at the age of 15 months, he no longer needs to maintain this uh, delusion that the that everything around him is just there to serve him. He's now out of the womb. Yeah. So that's the, a major portion of differentiation. So at 15 months, he, for the most part, uh, differentiates. He thinks he's a person and the mother's a person. But splitting is still being used, so it's not finished yet. See, because it's, gr it's a gradual process. So let's say the child does get his uh, mirroring needs met. Then he feels safe enough to differentiate. Now at the age of 15 or 18 months, uh, the, the role of the mother switches to that of being um, a secure, not only a secure base, but she offers what's called communicative matching. Now the child has a love affair with the world, but he realizes he's small and the world, there's so much out there in the world. He returns to his mother for emotional refueling, and the mother says, oh, you learned this. I can show you what I know about it. And the child is very curious and excited to learn. And this goes back and forth up until the age of three. And then if that takes place, the child has all of these memories of getting his symbiotic needs met, of getting his mirroring needs met, of getting his you know feelings of safety, all, of course, and fed properly, all the basic needs. So symbiotic needs met, the attunement to be seen, and then the secure base, and then the communicative matching needs met. By the age of three, the child feels, okay, uh, he can now get the key out from under mother's pillow. His life force, which originally was attached to the frightening side of the mother, it switches over to the image of the mother as a whole person. And then he feels safe enough to allow his life force to decathect from the other for himself. That's called a psychological birth. And when he has that uh, ontological security, sense of self, basic trust at the age of three, uh, he then has access to the real self. He feels safe enough to know his uniqueness. So there's a part of him called the real self with various capacities. So the real self allows the person to know what he likes, what his interests are. It allows him to feel that he's a little unique and he can express that and that's meaning, that's, that's his joy and pleasure. The real self, part of the self, allows the person a wide range of affect. If a person needs to mourn losses in later life, the real self will allow the person the necessary emotions to mourn the losses. Yeah. The real self allows the person a liveness of affect, so he can feel the serene, inexhaustible fullness of being. The real self, part of the self, um, allows the person to continue with mutuality. I'm okay, you're okay. That's natural, normal, healthy development. I'm okay, you're okay. So their relationships, their marriages become like fine wine. Right? 
they're not stuck in some unconscious battle of showing up the mother or um, rebelling against the mother or still trying to get mother's needs because they got they got it right um, at the age of three uh, when they all those loving memories the jargon is that's the internalized good object or another one is the holding interject and it becomes a part of him so there's this constant presence within him meaning his memories uh, that, that, that stay with him right? and this allows him to have relationships that are I'm okay you're okay he's not gonna unconsciously choose a rejecting person uh, because that because that rejecting person reminds them of how they were, were rejected as a child and they want to get a better outcome with that person right? and then the other person is doing the same thing and then they're in the, then the marriage has become like sour milk and there are other capacities of the of the real self that's a, another thread here so that's masterson's uh, one of his topics he has a book called the search for the real self and another one called simply the real self um, but to get to the real self um, you need to get the key out from under mother's pillow right? now mother's pillow that means uh, humans use pillows so you have to see the mother as a human not in your unconscious fantasy as a goddess or a demon. Right? So the mother is seen as an ordinary person. Now the pillow is whole, it's round. So not, not to split, not to have, the pillow has to, it's a whole pillow. Now to get the image, that's a metaphor of seeing the mother as a whole person. When you do that, then you get the key out from under mother's pillow. Now if trauma takes place before the age of three, uh, the child doesn't really go through that process. So what does he do? Uh, he's using emergency psychological maneuvers of the mind. Number one, uh, number one is splitting. Um, uh, number two is unconscious guilt, the moral defense, identification with the aggressor, reaction formation is there. Um, a lot of these emergency maneuvers of the mind uh, be are meant to be existential hearsay by the age of three. Um, so there's what's called the moral defense for example in the beginning if the child feels unloved uh, he feels badly uh, did he do something wrong why isn't mother meeting his needs he feels hurt and pain psychic pain mental pain he feels bad he, so that's unconscious guilt uh, now he has to preserve the attachment to the mother at all costs but he can't do it if he if he realizes the reality that the mother is rejecting him so he fabricates in his mind a hallucination that the mother's good. And, he, and then he has this thought that he's bonded to the good mother, when in reality he's bonded to the rejecting, disappointing, unavailable mother. That's called splitting. He creates two images of the mother. Good mother, bad mother, good breast, bad breast. Right? But he's bonded to the bad breast. Because there is no good breast to bond to. Now, he would bond to the good breast if the loving memories outweigh the frustration. Okay? But if the frustration outweighs the love, the child can't handle that. So he, he fantasizes that he's bonded to a good mother. Yeah. That's called splitting. Now, the moral defense is, he makes, it's as if he makes this moral decision. All right, the child thinks, I'll, make, I'll be this little judge and think that mother's going to be the good one and I'm going to be the bad one. And that's how he gets his attachment needs met. That's a temporary device, that's a temporary maneuver. With enough love by the age of three, this all gets sorted out, and the natural development is that he's okay, mother's okay. Two differentiated people, it later on leads to what someone calls mutual um, relating, I'm okay, you're okay relating. Um, now, if there's too much pain um, around that, the child may identify with the aggressor. If it's, he may temporarily hold on to the idea that he's not okay and mother's okay. It's a lie, but he'll hold on to that for a while. But if it's too painful, he may just identify with the aggressor and adopt his own hallucinated image of the mother being okay and adopt that attitude for himself. And then he hallucinates that he's okay. Then he gets some relief by that if he thinks he's okay. Uh, now what about... Um, now, where's his true self? The true self is repressed. The true self got squelched. It's called the hungry, enraged, empty part self. Um, 
the despised self, the shamed self, etc. Now when something's repressed, it's seen outward to preserve the repression. So now that child adopts the attitude that he's okay and others are not okay. But when he says that others are not okay, he's talking about himself seen outward. It's a, falsi a falsification of reality. So he, he then thinks badly about others to communicate that when he was a child, he believed that his mother thought badly of him. Maybe the mother was just on the phone, it was innocent, but the child interprets things differently. Because of his small size, the, the baby has no concept of the passage of time. If the mother's on the phone and he's hungry, the baby thinks he might he's going to be abandoned. Immense anxiety, persecutory anxiety, abandonment, depression. So he creates an image of the mother as this, uh, as, uh, as some kind of frightening character out of a fairy tale or a myth. Um, so previous videos sort of elaborated on some of these ideas, but um, um, so these quotes, 1001 Windmills of the Mind, um, uh, they're trying to help us to heal from some of this. Right? If we're still using splitting, if we're still, uh, you see, according to where the trauma takes place, a certain personality pattern can develop. If the trauma takes place between four and five months, that's the hostile provocative attachment style. If the trauma takes place between uh, five, five months and 15 months, that's the narcissistic pattern. Right? So they devalue others to communicate that their mother devalued them and they're stuck there like Sisyphus. But when they do that, they feel triggered of the mother devaluing them. Then to communicate that they were devalued, they devalue others to communicate that they were devalued. But when they do that, they feel devalued and then and they repeat. So they're stuck like Sisyphus. So, the, so their main emotions are, um, they're constantly trying to show up the mother. Um, one author says that when he's doing that, he's trying to communicate to the mother in the mind. Look, mother in the mind, look how I'm devaluing others with my negative put down humor. Uh, well, that's what you did to me, and I didn't like it, and I'm showing you. But he's talking to a phantom. Right? So a negative memory, Lowell's metaphor, that's like a phantom or a ghost. And he's stuck there. Uh, now, if the trauma takes place between 15 months and 36 months, that's the codependent pattern. The codependent pattern got enough love to pass through the 15 or 18 month mark. But if they get stuck between 18 months and 36 months, they're still holding on to I'm not okay and others are okay. So they're the pleasers and the clingers and uh, uh, they sacrifice themselves too much to uh, take care of others because they're still looking for good, a good parent to complete the process and they're stuck there. So they're the clingers, right? So, um, and there are other patterns uh, personality patterns that arise out of what's called an insecure attachment style. Now remember, one estimate is that 70% of the babies in North America are getting an insecure attachment style. Only 30%, their marriages are like fine wine, they say. Yeah. They, en they enjoy their hobbies. Uh, now these hobbies are not based on putting others down. We're not talking about schadenfreude. Uh, they're, they're talking about the joy of expressing their uniqueness. That doesn't hurt anybody. Them shining their light doesn't hurt anybody. Um, so we're talking about like genuine, intra, genuine hobbies, not based on hurting others, putting others down to get serotonin by putting yourself in the one up position. Not that, not that meaning of a hobby. In that uh, movie, um, what was it? I forgot the movie, but they they were talking about some teacher who was going to retire. And he said his greatest joy is to go in the woods and hunt ducks. Really? That's your hobby? And they thought he was some kind of good teacher. Oh yeah, the Donna Reed show. I think it's a 50s sitcom. Uh, they were praising some teacher... Uh, and I was confused about it because uh, I thought if he's really such a good teacher, his personality is that he gets his main pleasure in life is to shoot 
innocent, beautiful birds flying in the sky. And he gets his thrills by doing that. The guy's a sicko. I didn't understand that show, but um, so that's that's we're not talking about that kind of joy. Um, so Schadenfreude is a pathological joy. So Schadenfreude, um, that's uh, the mother felt good when the baby took care of the mother. Yeah, the mother, but the baby felt put down by that. He identifies with the aggressor, puts down others to get the serotonin that the mother got because he adopted his mother's thinking. The theory is, if the baby is unloved, his ego is submerged. There's a vacuum there. Okay. The baby adopts his mother's way of thinking. Now, the mother's way of thinking was to use the baby to comfort her. Okay. So he adopts that thinking for himself. Then he uses others to communicate that his mother used him. Then he gets his serotonin, just like the mother got serotonin. That's a pathological joy. Right. Getting relief by putting others down. Um, that that's a uh, that's so we're calling that Schadenfreude. Right? Um, we're not talking about temporary stress. If that's like an enduring personality pattern, we mean it that way, right? Um, so these quotes are helping us to um, heal from an insecure attachment style wherever it took place. Because an insecure attachment style precludes, prevents, blocks, uh, doesn't allow the psychological birth. The psychological birth is the I'm okay, you're okay mindset. Anything other than the I'm okay, you're okay mindset is an aberration, is, is a sign of the insecure attachment style. An insecure attachment style means that the, that the, babies, uh, that the baby received more disappointment, frustration, and rejection uh, then love and satisfaction during the first three years. Um, so um, it's this verdict of reality that makes the work of mourning so painful. So these quotes are helping us um, to set us free. The truth will upset you free. Yeah. So uh, once we recognize what's called unconscious ambivalence and accept the reality that the mother didn't have it to offer, when we get that the mother didn't have it to off offer because she was stuck in her existential dilemma, then we understand why, then we understand ourselves. So we have to understand the other to understand ourselves. So that that's, and in the process, we're entering into the, the grief work process. So we're picking up the golden feather. Right? So the fire bird is in the bag we drag behind us. But one day we may see the golden feather so that's, that means we're starting the journey. So again, so much of who we are, our feelings, our vitality, um, you know, our the real self, the ability to mourn, the ability, the capacities of the real self, they all get put into this bag that we drag behind us. So we want to re-own what we lost in childhood. Um, I feel like this was sort of a, a clumsy introduction to this uh, project. My apologies about it. Um, so why don't we just um, launch into the qu this batch of quotes. So we'll be adding some quotes to our different threads in this series. Um, so the main idea of my clumsy introduction is that um, the psychological, so what, what Mahler says, the psychological birth of the infant doesn't automatically take place with the biological birth, that there's this process. The child needs more love than frustration to go through this process. If the frustration is more than the love, there's a fixation. There's a developmental trauma, arrested development. There's a fixation at the rejection level of not getting our symbiotic needs met. Okay, that's the power and control. Uh, they think the world is like a jungle. Okay, they, love and gratitude haven't entered the psychological picture. That's why they only think about power and control. They, they didn't receive the love. So they don't have no, they don't really have a concept of it. Um, they only want relief. If they have power and control, they they get serotonin. If they don't have it. They feel the stress of not being loved. So that's their main mo, right? And then if they're if they're in a negative symbiosis with the mother, if they are fused with the mother, and that's the hostile, provocative attachment, 
sorry, that's the narcissistic pattern, then they've identified with the aggressor. So they're putting others down to communicate that the mother put them down. You see? So that's a narcissistic pattern. And that can take different, and there are different variations of it. Yeah. Um, and then we have the codependent pattern. So there, there's this process that we go through. If if there if the depending on where the pain outweighs the love, a fixation takes place. A fixation at the rejection level of not getting their symbiotic needs met. A fixation at the rejection level of not feeling safe enough to leave the symbiotic fusion with the mother. A fixation at not getting enough love and support uh, to complete the process. So there's a fixation somewhere. So these quotes are helping us to uh, lift the anchor, to release in, in the fairy tale Kiriku and the Sorceress, a very good uh, animation, a French animation with English. Actually, it's, it's in English. The, the dubbing is very good. Actually, ironically, usually the subtitles are better than the dubbing. But in this case, if you're going to watch Kiriku and the Sorceress, I would suggest the dubbing. It's very good. In that uh, animation, uh, the metaphor was, um, well, you can see a metaphor of it. It's, it's very vivid. So we want to lift the anchor on the arrest development. Right? In the film, it's uh, the woman had a thorn. So you want to pull the thorn to find freedom. We'll play a song about emotional freedom at the end. Um, she, she was very, she says she wants that freedom. Freedom, <laughs> Aretha Franklin. Um, okay, so um, we're going to begin this batch of quotes from a quote from a very good comic series. So this is highly recommended, okay? So in 1955, four comics uh, were done. There, there they are there. Now these four got bundled up into this book. Okay, so this is the complete series there, right? And there are um, three characters here. Now, this is not some frivolous, you know, entertainment. This is actually a demonstration of the therapy process put into the put into comic form. It's actually a, an educational. This is very educational. This is the best introduction to psychoanalysis. This one here. I think every high school kid should get this. There are 12 therapy sessions throughout the series. I think in school, they should spend, uh, they should do one a week for 12 weeks, you know. But anyways, there are three, there are three clients, three therapy sessions with Freddie, four with Ellen, and five with uh, Mark there for a total of 12 sessions, right? That's Ellen there on the couch. So we'll start with one quote with Ellen, right? Okay, TQ1705. Okay, the therapist says, Can't you see that your subconscious attitude toward yourself is consciously directed at others? You blame yourself for the rejection you felt as a child. You have come to expect this rejection from everyone. You divorce yourself from people because you look down upon yourself and can't believe that they could accept you and offer you love. But you discovered in past sessions that your childhood rejection was not of your making, Ellen. That you had no control over it that it was caused by many factors not involving you. Why continue to blame yourself or judge people today by the emotional judgments of your childhood? We have a thread in this series on unconscious guilt. So this sort of ties in with our thread on unconscious guilt. Again, we have over 30 threads in this series. One on the moral defense, one, identif one on identification with the aggressor, one on symbiosis, one on the narcissistic pattern, one on the hostile provocative attachment style, one on the codependent pattern, one on the narcissistic pattern, one on projection, projective identification, reaction formation, right? one on rationalization, emotional eating, 
the psychology of religion, psychology of prejudice. Yeah. Um, so we have a one on unconscious guilt. So we're gonna. So this quote adds to our thread on unconscious guilt. Okay. So let's do it again here. Let's see if it shows up. Uh, how is it showing up here? Let's see. Okay. So um, so we're gonna start here, right? Hopefully you're seeing it okay. Okay. Can't you see that your subconscious attitude toward yourself is consciously directed at others? So what happens is when the child feels unloved, that's psychic pain, mental pain, emotional pain, he feels that he did something wrong, that he's no good, right? Um, so there's unconscious guilt. Now to deal with the pain of that, the person may project that. If that's repressed, he can't accept it. He sees it outwardly. So he says others are bad and no good as a defense mechanism of facing how he feels bad or no good. Okay. So Ellen would project her unconscious guilt onto others and she thought others uh, either are no good themselves or she may project the rejecting mother onto others and expect that others will think that she's no good. So she's doing both at the same time. Right? You have, right, and as a result Right? Of course she's going to feel angry about that. Right? Now, in identification with the aggressor, she hates herself. Right? So if the mother hated her, and she, and she does to her, and she does... If the, if the mother hated her, and she identifies with the aggressor, to have a loyalty to the mother, to have the attachment, she's going to hate herself, to have the connection with the mother. So that's the condition of her having a connection to the mother. She has to hate herself. Right? You have, right, let's see, how's it showing up here, is that better? You have, a, you have a contempt for yourself and even a loathing. You think you are not worthy of love, hence you've withdrawn into a shell. You blame yourself for the rejection you felt as a child and have come to expect this rejection from everyone. You divorce yourself from people because you look down upon yourself and can't believe that they could offer and accept you. But you discovered, still showing up here, let's see, I think it's showing up, okay, so we're doing this one here, okay, but you discovered uh, in past sessions that your childhood rejection was not of your making Ellen, that you had no control over it, that it was not caused, that it was caused by many factors not involving you. Why continue to blame yourself or judge people today by the emotional judgments of your childhood? And it goes on. So there are four therapy sessions um, related to Ellen's uh, unconscious guilt. So that's a very good episode. Yeah. And um, so this th this so. Coming up in a future video, in the next video, we'll be we'll be adding some more quotes to unconscious guilt. But just as a preview, since we're on the topic here, here's sort of a, a bit of a preview about unconscious guilt. Okay, the infant incapable, the the baby incapable of distinguishing frustration from punishment. Okay, because of a lack of self-object differentiation, experiences frustration as punishment. Okay, so the authors, they sometimes uh, use, use it in a synonymous way. They say that when the baby feels disappointed or frustrated, that's synonymous with being punished. Because of the fusion, the baby's concept of himself and his concept of the mother are fused, it's one. And he thinks, the baby thinks that the other is him, it's an extension of him. So he's punishing himself, you get it? When the baby's at the breast, breastfeeding, the baby thinks the breast is actually his. It's him. It's a part of him. Now, if the breast is rejecting him, is Mr. Toon there, he then later on hurts himself. Because that's his MO. That's his neural network. If the mother is using a bottle and a schedule, the baby's being rejecting. The baby feels that he's rejecting himself. He doesn't get that, it, uh, that it's the mother who's doing it. You see? A key concept about unconscious guilt. Again, when the baby's in the womb, 
He thinks the womb environment is all about him. It's there to serve him. The theory is he may think that it's a part of him. He's like a little god. Everything is about him. All right. Sound familiar? That's the narcissistic pattern. Everything's about them. Now, at the breastfeeding period, the theory is that's still there. So if the breast mother is rejecting him, the baby thinks he's rejecting him. So he now to have a bond, now he needs the breast mother for the nourishment. But the condition is he's got to reject himself, but he's got to do it in a rejecting way to have a connection to it. You see? So that's why they say that uh, if the baby's frustrated, he's punishing himself. And that's how he gets his attachment. So that's the structure of, uh, that's why there's unconscious guilt. So this self-punishment uh, uh, is synonymous with unconscious guilt. He feels bad, no good, he did something wrong, he's not getting loved, that means he did something wrong, and so on. He can't say that he's okay anymore. He has to say that he's not okay. Even if it means creating the hallucination that the other is okay, because he has to do that to have a connection. You see how, you see the splitting going on, the moral defense splitting? Okay. Another one here. Okay, unconscious guilt feelings seek relief through projection onto others, sometimes known as scapegoating. So Ellen, in this story here, she thought all people were, uh, she didn't, she liked people, but she was shy. She, was, she had a lot of social anxiety, but the structure of it was she unconsciously thought that they're going to be rejecting, that they're no good and they're going to not want her. So she projected how she didn't want herself onto others. Now, when she projects this idea that she didn't want herself, it's false. She's projecting how the mother was misattuned. She got confused. She read a magazine that said, use the bottle and follow the schedule. So the mother was confused. So this wasn't Ellen's doing. You get it? This wasn't her doing. She didn't... So... <laughs> <laughs> it's a key concept because people have been struggling with this idea for 150 years. What is this unconscious guilt? I think this is it here. They got it in, 19, in this comic. This comic book answers it right here. This is an excellent comic book. Okay, So the baby thinks the breast is a part of him. If the breast is unavailable, if the breast is rejecting him, he thinks he's rejecting himself. Okay, So he's rejecting himself. So Ellen believed that others are going to reject them because when the, when she felt rejected by the breast, that got that the pain of that is repressed. When something's repressed, it's seen outward. It's called projection. Projection is the means of preserving the repression. It, projection is a defense mechanism against psychic pain. So the baby not getting loved, that's psychic pain. To, to, to not feel that psychic pain, they trick their mind to think that the cause of everything is all outward. It distracts them. It's outward, so it's not within. It's a distraction. It's a distraction device. So Ellen regarded others, automatically believed that others are going to reject them because she projected how she rejected herself. But when she rejected herself, it wasn't true. She didn't reject herself. An actual mother rejected her, you see. But she's projecting this confusion onto others, you see. Um, okay, uh, one metaphor for this is the ghost. So when we talk about ghosts, that's the projection of unconscious guilt feelings. Okay, now in all neurotic personalities, Okay, it's all, unconscious guilt is involved. Okay, so seventy percent of the population is dealing with unconscious guilt, right? Now, to hide all of this, the person may have a very uh, rigid personality. Okay. So to maintain the repression of the unconscious guilt, the person may have a very rigid personality. Right? And to, 
to constantly see others in a negative way. And they may be very rigid about it, but the motivation for doing that is to preserve the unconscious guilt, to preserve the painful memory of how they fake believe that they rejected themselves. They didn't reject themselves. The baby just wanted love. But he believed, he had a false belief that he rejected himself because he had a false belief that the mother, that, that the breast was hit, was him. It wasn't. But that's, he had this false belief. So it's hard. Okay. <laughs> so we'll follow. So that's a, that's, those quotes are for the next video. Um, okay. Now Ibsen. Okay, the famous playwright, Ibsen's dictum about the writing of plays, that it meant sitting in judgment on oneself. Okay, so when you're doing self-reflection, uh, you're going to face this unconscious guilt. So psychoanalysis never lost sight of the problem presented by a sense of guilt. Okay, so a genuine writer faces this question. He faces this question of why he feels like a criminal. Unconscious guilt. He's not guilty, but he feels it. Why does he feel it? He, because he thought that when the breast refused him, he thought that he refused himself. That he punished himself. And he's stuck there. Now, a good writer is meant to, to shine light on this, right? To bring this to consciousness. Once it's conscious, we can make new choices. Freedom, right? So we're going to end, so let's end this video with that song by Aretha Franklin called Think. Yeah. Okay, well, okay, let's move on. So that's a little bit about unconscious guilt. So we'll, we'll add another quote to our thread on, um, it's sort of related to it. Burglar's famous for two expressions, his most, the writer's block and uh, this uh, unconscious uh, uh, the Injustice Collector. Uh, so we'll add one to our burglar's uh, work here. Okay, the Injustice Collector manages to preserve some portion of his infantile illusion of magical power. In his alleged omnipotence resides in his... Okay, his alleged omnipotence resides in his habit of provocation. The unhappy result which follows, the unconscious guilt which follows proves to him that he can make things happen. Okay, The ability to create this, um, uncon this unhappy result okay, leaves the superego temporarily disarmed. Punishment becomes meaningless when it is self-brought on. Okay, for His metaphor is, for example, now he uses a metaphor here. So, for example, no... Uh, a dictator can tolerate being tricked out of his most valuable weapon, the threat of punishment. So Burglar uses this metaphor that in the unconscious, it's different. Uh, things are different from the conscious. In the conscious, uh, we have a sense of uh, if we act like an adult, we build self-esteem. If we do something moral, it's good. We feel good about ourselves. But in the unconscious, things are a little different, he says. So in the, in the unconscious, Burgos' metaphor is that if the baby is uh, bonded to the rejecting breast and he's rejecting himself, he says the baby's masochistically bonded to the rejecting breast. And if he's stuck there. Now the memory of this, the record keeper of this, uh, is called the superego. So if the person later on tries to do something, tries to self-activate from the real self, the superego says no. That's what he means here. You have to face this first. You can't deny this. You have to heal this first. If you want to be if you want to find your real self first you got to heal you got to you got to get the key out from under mother's pillow you got like this comic you got to like this pretty you have to face this you have to read this comic here read the story about ellen okay read her story 
So you have to read her story first before you're going to be happy. That's what he means here. Now, Burglar's theory is that when the child uh, is unloved, he still hangs on. All, he, all that he has left is his magical thinking that he can create things. And, and he takes refuge in that. So if he feels, if he does something that's self-defeating, um, at least he, crea he created it. So he has some self-esteem in the sense that he created something, even though it was painful. And he's taking refuge in that. That's what he means. So the truth... So the child's self has two parts, the true self and the grandiose part self. Now the grandiose part self dissipates at the age of 15 months. But if the true self is unavailable, it gets put into this bag, the golden ball is in the bag, all he has left is the grandiose part self in cooperation with the superego. The superego is the unconscious guilt that's rejecting him. Now he's going to create it. So first the mother created it, uh, now he creates it, so he has, so he's active in that way. It's called pseudo aggression. Burglar's jargon. So we have a thread in this series on uh, Edmund Burger's theory of the four steps. So this quote here sort of adds to it a little bit. Uh, I'm not going to read do the whole idea here. So why don't we just uh, move on? Okay, from the TV show Judd for the Defense. Okay, uh, it was a crime story, a legal drama. Uh, the lawyer said to, uh, to, to the criminal, now you committed these crimes because you had two reasons. One, to gratify your pathetic little ego. Okay, that's the, so he had no, so this guy, now you could see it, he had no true self. All he had was this uh, narcissistic entitlement. He thought he was, he was some kind of cult leader or something. All he had was this grandiose part self, right? So he commits crimes uh, to show how important he is, and he can get away with it. He's so important, and he uses his advanced uh, education skills to do that, right? So he was a criminal, this guy. Now, the second reason was, you're doing this to revenge yourself on this town you hate by showing them up. Okay, so this criminal projected his the bad breast mother. He projected the bad mother, the rejecting mother, onto the, t onto the small town that he was living in. So he regarded the whole town as his mother. Now the mother rejected him. He wants to say how bad the mother is by transferring the image of the mother onto the town. Now he wants to say how bad the town is. So he's trying to show up. He wants to prove how bad the town is. So that's why he, he was doing those things. Very insightful episode. Judge for the Defense. I forgot which episode it was. It ran in the late 60s. An excellent TV drama called Judge for the Defense. Unfortunately, it's not on DVD. It's hard to find. Um, it's uh, Sometimes it gets posted on YouTube and then they pull it down. I don't know why. They, it's an excellent TV show. It's very psychologically minded. And uh, we've posted already a few quotes from that show so we've added another one so again we have a thread in this series on uh, psychoanalytically minded quotes from uh, movies and TV shows so we've just added one more here pseudo defense is mistaken for wishes just keep that phrase in mind Pseudo defenses mistaken for wishes. Some people say they have a wish. That's not a wish. That's a defense mechanism that's being used to preserve another defense mechanism. And that defense mechanism is being used to hide the unconscious guilt. So that's not a real wish. A person says, oh, I want to do this. Is that what you really want? No, but I feel like I should do it. I feel like I should want it. Why? Well, I don't know. It just, I guess it would make me feel better. Really? Not really. Well, so what are you doing? Well, I don't know. So he's confused. So this is he, what he's doing is he's using a defense mechanism to squelch away the pain of him using another defense mechanism that's underneath it. 
And that earlier, that leading defense mechanism is being used to squelch the unconscious guilt. Okay, what about group therapy? Well, to ask a client to join group therapy is often tantamount to asking him to return to his original family constellation with all of its accompanying trauma. So, <laughs> this is sort of a humorous one a bit. The guy thought if he joins a group, what's going to happen is he's going to project his family scenario into the group, into the present. He doesn't want to do that. But the purpose of joining the group is for him to see his family scenario. The repetition compulsion of replaying his childhood past into the present is like creating a mirror. The group is there as a, it functions in a, to some degree as a mirror for him to see his childhood. Okay, um, the manic defense. By adopting a one-up scornful attitude towards internal reality, the client resorts to the manic defense, sometimes called tox toxic masculinity. Now this phrase, to toxic masculinity, has nothing to do with a person's, whether he's a man or a woman, it has nothing to do with that. When we reject our feelings, when we don't believe in such a thing as unconscious guilt, uh, so when we reject our feelings, so anytime a person, regardless of anything else, when a, when a, when a homo sapien, when a human being, when a person re rejects their feelings, that's called toxic masculinity. Now some women um, have it even more strongly than some men. So there's nothing to do with gender, right? So Woodman makes a point about this. Miriam Woodman emphasizes this. She says some women are actually more negative patriarchal than men are, she says. She gave the example of her own therapist. She said how he was very much in touch with his feelings. And that's how she learned to become in touch with her feelings. And the therapist was a man and she was a woman. So it's nothing to do with... Um, okay, the next one here. Interpretation seeks to bring out the latent Okay, the hidden, the true meaning, okay, the, the real meaning of a, sub, of a person's words and behavior. Its aim is to reveal unconscious desires and the defensive conflicts that are linked to them. The primary goal of interpretation is the lifting of the resistance. Okay, the cure is not the result of a premature recognition of whatever has been repressed, but a, but occurs through a victory over the resistances as the source of this ignorance. That's a good quote. I don't know I don't I don't know if I read it well enough, but um, it's posted below. I suggest a read through of this quote. A victory over your defense mechanisms when you recognize that using them that, that you're not aware that you when you're not a you're not aware that you're using defense mechanisms when you're aware that you're using them that's a victory and that that leads to the healing that's what it means okay an individual's internal Reality corresponds to a collection of representations, affects, processes that are essentially unconscious. Okay, now many uh, theorists uh, ponder right, about how it becomes internalized. So there's a lot of discussion about this internal theater, this internal object relations world. How does the baby represent his memories? The answer is in a myth or a fairy tale. A myth or a fairy tale represents the internal world, the internal theater. A myth or a fairy tale represents a traumatized psyche. An entire myth, that represents one psyche. All of the characters represent our memories in personified form. Right? So the frightening, the helpful goddess is, represents when the mother was loving. The rejecting um, goddess the Medusa or whatever, that represents when the mother was unavailable. 
the child uh, has these images in his uh, in his limbic system somewhere. That's the theory, right? Um, so, so that it's not reality, but the baby perceives things in this exaggerated way because of his small size. The mother's this giantess in the nursery. The baby projects his anger towards the image of the rejecting mother. Yeah. Then he thinks the rejecting mother is this angry entity. Yeah. Now if there's trauma there, the child has this in his mind and it's influencing how he sees the present. Yeah. He may identify with one of those characters, project uh, the frightening breast mother onto non-threatening substitute others. He may identify with the aggressor, project his unloved self onto others. Okay. Now all of this projection and, and transference and parataxic distortion, um, okay. um, the theory is it's called, he's trying to get a better outcome from his childhood past. Now it's like Sisyphus, he's going to keep, he's going to keep on doing it until he gets a better outcome, but he's never going to get a better outcome. No one in the present can be the breast mother. That was a one-time deal. Um, just like the physical birth was a one-time deal. It can't be redone. If a person had birth trauma, we can't go back into the womb and redo it and get a better outcome for the biological. Now for the psychological birth, the same thing. That process was a one-time deal. We can't redo that. Some people try, but you can't. But the attempt to try that fantasy to try, that's a mirror to recognize that we didn't get the love we needed. Then you got to understand the mother, read the Enneagram, right? and uh, understanding the mother and forgiveness are the same thing. Okay, a couple of, a couple of more um, quote, quotes here. Okay, Imago. Okay. So the baby creates a fantastical image of the mother. When the, when the baby's fed, he thinks it's like a goddess experience. He had an, ex he had an experience with a goddess, a beautiful, divine, super, wonderful, all-powerful, loving being. That's his concept. When the breast is unavailable, he thinks he had an experience with Medusa. So that... This unconscious fantasy, these fantasized personifications of his experiences. Again, this is pre-verbal, so baby thinks in, the baby thinks in images. This is pre-verbal. It's called primary process thinking. So he has an image in his fantasy of goddess and demon. That's the imago. These images, these exaggerated images are called imagos. Okay, imago. An unconscious prototype of personae. The imago determines the way in which the baby understands his mother and later others. It is elaborated based on the earliest real and phantasmatic intersubjective relations with family members. Again, imago, an unconscious prototype of personae. The imago determines the way in which the subject apprehends others. It's, it is elaborated it is elaborated based on the earliest real and imagined intersubjective relations with family members. So if the mother was traumatizing early on, if she's more loving later on, it can be corrected. But the mother only has up until the age of five at the very latest. Right? If the mother's, if she continues to be rejecting, the frightening image of the mother may have been one thing, but by the age of five, the frightening image may be like a Medusa. Yeah. Okay, the therapist's work is to bring forth the anxiety linked to the client's earliest imagos, thus facilitating the passage to the, depress to the depressive position. Okay. So we have a theory, we have a thread on Melanie Klein's theory about the positions. 
When the baby uses splitting, goddess and demon, that's, she calls that the paranoid schizoid position. Emphasis on the word position. So splitting. Um, when we bring the split images of the mother together, goddess and demon, into an ordinary human, that's called the, she calls that the depressive position, meaning the baby would feel bad if if he were to get if he were to get angry at the one he loves, he would feel sad about it. It's nothing to do with how, with how it sounds. Um, but with the splitting, uh, things are very uh, immediate. This all good, this all bad, and that's it. Um, the narcissistic pattern, useful, not useful, very simple. They don't deal with uh, the reality that they're bonded to, to the frightening image of the mother. Love and gratitude haven't entered the psychological picture. You need to bring uh, the split images come together. When the mother is more loving than frustrating, the split images come together. When the split images come together, then we say that love and gratitude have entered the psychological picture. If he's splitting precludes that. So you want to heal the splits. So one therapist says the goal of therapy is to heal the splits. That's what he says here. The analyst's work is to bring forth the anxiety. Okay, that's called persecutory anxiety, right? Linked to the client's earliest imagos, okay, goddess and demon, right? Now, the, so the therapist is helping him in this area, thus facilitating the passage to the depressive position, okay? So he says, this quote says, the goal of therapy is to move from the persecutory anxiety of the paranoid schizoid position and enter into the more advanced healthy position called the depressive anxiety out of the depressive position. That means you're healing the splits. If splitting is still being used, the person never mourns losses. Splitting precludes mourning. If a person doesn't mourn losses because of the splitting, splitting preclude, splitting prevents um, mourning. Maybe I should just take like a little break here. Hold on a sec. Let's see. You want to see the outside here? Okay, a little rain here. Cloudy day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's about it's about zero outside, or maybe one or two or something like that. Um, so, um, yeah, so s splitting precludes mourning. If a person doesn't mourn losses, that can lead to complicated grief, aggravated grief. Chronic sorrow, pathological uh, nostalgia, melancholia. It can lead to the symptoms of PTSD. And it can lead to, as one person said, to becoming a curmudgeon late in life. Right. So the curmudgeon, very miserly, very bitter, stingy, like the Scrooge, you know. Not an elder, not serving, not contributing, not building. No. He's just in battle with the mother all the time. He's angry at the mother the whole time. And his, ang and his anger at the world, uh, that's him trying to communicate how he's angry at the mother. You know? and, he th and he regards others as being the refusing mother. He puts others, he's rude towards others to communicate that, that his mother was rude towards him and he's angry about it. Now when he does that, he re-triggered, he hurts himself. Because of the fusion, the first, the early quote there. Uh, tomorrow's quote, uh, briefly mentioned at the beginning of this video about the fusion, undifferentiation. Um, so when he when he is rude towards others, he atom, he's automatically rude towards himself because of the psychic fusion. It's psychic reality we're talking about. See, 
So when he hurts others, he hurts himself in his emotionality. Now, now he's angry at that. He's angry that his mother hurt him, that, that, is, that he hurt himself. At the same time, his mother hurt him because he is the mother. So he hurts others to communicate that, but when he does that, he hurts himself. Now, if he spends his whole life doing that, he's going to become a curmudgeon, not an elder. So splitting precludes mourning. This masochistic attachment to the refusing mother precludes mourning. This fusion with the mother, being identification with the aggressor, okay, being the mother, this tar pit of the negative symbiosis, okay, that's yeah, that, all of that precludes mourning. Okay, the next one here. Okay, neutrality. The analytic situation contains nothing that would absolutely differentiate it from the way human beings habitually behave towards one another. It is only the analyst neutrality that allows the true nature of the client's uh, relation, uh, that allows the true nature of the client's relations to be seen. To be seen. He's saying here that um, if the therapist is neutral, if he's safe, then it's easier to see how the person deals with people in general. Okay, many with arrested psychic development regard another person's morality as a betrayal to their omnipotence, a betrayal to their psychological viewpoint. Okay, so if the person has arrested development, he's going to think in us and them terms. If another, per if another person thinks in I'm okay, you're okay terms, uh, he thinks that that other person uh, is not is not mirroring him. Therefore, he feels betrayed. So ironically, the, the more wounded person who thinks I'm okay, you're not okay, or I'm not okay, you're okay, or I'm not okay, you're not okay, one of these aberrations, if he sees someone who thinks in the healthy way, he thinks the healthy person is is uh, is betraying him. Because he's only looking for mirroring. Yeah. Um, okay. The superego is not only autonomous, but is set far above the rest of the ego, hence its name. Yeah, so why do we call it the superego? So the ego is our consciousness. The superego is the unconscious guilt. The memory, the unconscious conscience, it has like a mind of its own. Right? So <laughs> that's what he means. By it. it's, a, it's, an, it's another ego. So the superego is another ego, but it's more powerful than our conscious little ego. In particular, when there's trauma, the more trauma there is, the, the more the superego is. Now, the superego is all about... fusion with the rejecting mother. He's waiting for mother's love, but he's not getting it. So the superego says, that's that. That's the superego. Still waiting for mother's love. The baby needs love to leave her. He, so the baby's in a catch-22. He's, he's stuck with the mother who's not loving him. He needs her love to leave her, but he's not getting it. So he, he's stuck there. So that's similar to the double bind. If he leaves the mother, he's going to face the Furies. That's the metaphor for the persecutory anxiety. So Orestes faced the Furies, so he did it. So he's our hero, our Roma, a true hero. He faced the persecutory anxiety. He faced the Furies, right? and he succeeded. Yeah. But, but generally speaking, uh, the double bind is if he wants to be, if he wants to leave the mother, he feels that he can't, it's too, there's too much anxiety around it. But if he stays with the mother, he's being impinged upon, engulfed. Now, if he leaves the mother, he feels abandoned and the persecutory anxiety. So if he, he's damned if he does, if he, he's damned if he doesn't. So if he leaves the mother, he feels scared. If he stays with the mother, he feels hurt. 
So he's in a so he's in a catch twenty two. He's in a double bind because of the catch twenty two. The catch twenty two creates the double bind. Put it that way. The catch twenty two creates the double bind. Um, okay, hypomania is a defense against unconscious guilt. Okay. Did you really expect the conscious and the unconscious to be identical? So burglar is a metaphor. Uh, his analogy is, imagine that it were possible for you to visit another planet where beings similar to humans dwelt. Would you be astonished if the indigenous people of that planet refused to take your dollar bills in payment for their goods? Okay. <laughs> So that's a dramatic, that, that's, that's, that's a pretty good analogy. So let's say humans discover a planet out there and there are um, <laughs> people who look like homo sapiens, let's say. And let's say, hey, you guys, uh, we'll give you some of our uh, bills here that we have in our pocket and you give us some of the stuff that you have on your planet. <laughs> so obviously they're not going to recognize it. So that's his metaphor. The unconscious currency and the conscious currency or the, the conscious thinking, the conscious values and the unconscious thinking and the unconscious values are different. That's what he means. Different worlds. We live in two worlds. Okay, owing to unconscious guilt, mothers who adopt the Jocasta style of mothering must have constant reassurance that they are good mothers, not bad as they fear. Yeah, so the mother who adopts the Jocasta style of mothering, meaning she parentifies the child, meaning she uses the child to comfort her, she must feel badly about it. But what if she can coax the child to say, hey, look, on Mother's Day, you have to give me a t-shirt that says that I'm the world's greatest mother. That, that eases her unconscious guilt. Okay, uh, the next one here. In marriage, scenes from the family are reenacted over and over in an effort to resolve or complete what was left unfinished from childhood. Okay, repetition compulsion. Quote, I can understand why you would think, feel, or do that coming from where you are. Okay. So, if you're coming from the point of view of trying to replay your childhood scene in the present, then I can understand why you think, feel, and behave this way. That's what he means. Okay, the religious one. So, we'll end up um, with two quotes on our thread on the psychology of religion. Now, this series is not about the sociological aspects. Uh, with the exception of our thread on the psychology of uh, prejudice. So the psychology of prejudice, uh, for the most part, comes from the internal dynamics of the trauma. When there's repression, there's projection. When there's projection, uh, there's prejudice. Then there's rationalizations. Then there's negative magic gesture, doing to others to communicate what was done to you. So prejudice can come from these areas. But uh, we have a quote. Um, we had a quote uh, a while ago where he said that you're being too one-sided. What about the sociological side? So then, okay, so we'll briefly, so we briefly created a sub-thread on the sociological side um, the sociological factors that lead to prejudice. So within this sociological thread, we've, we've talked about already about the transition um, that happened 10,000 years ago with the birth of farming and agriculture, with the serotonin and the dopamine. Um, so I won't go over it here again. But the theory is that 10,000 years ago, uh, we created... Um, the prejudiced personality in order to pillage out of the panic of not getting 
out of the weather problems. So out of, out of climate, uh, we panicked. Out of the panic, we decided to pillage. In order to pillage, we have to create the prejudiced personality. How do you create the prejudiced personality? Well, you suffer the children. That's what they said. You, you traumatize the babies. You, you separate them from the mother when they're born. They're traumatized. So they're going to think that they're okay and others are not okay. Now, if they have that attitude, it's easy for them to th have an us-them attitude. And then, uh, then you get others to, uh, to do all the work. Okay? So poverty is man-made um, out of the panic uh, to, to plunder, out of the panic from the weather. Because we got so much serotonin with the birth of farming. Um, I don't want to go over the whole thing here. So one sociological factor is that something changed 10,000 years ago. We created an economic model called global pillage. But to do it, we need the prejudiced personality. Now, how do you create the prejudiced personality? Then we invented religion. Religion promotes repression. So that's a sociological factor to prejudice. Religion promotes prejudice because it promotes repression. So we'll add one more quote to it. Okay, okay. religion is made so as to wipe out vices, so they say. But in reality, it covers them up. It nourishes them and it incites them. So I wanted to add this one here to um, TQ, an earlier quote. I want to update an earlier quote. Um, TQ uh, 1203. So... 12, I'm going to update 12.03 here about religion. Okay. Okay, regarding religion. Okay, quote, religion is for those who are afraid of unconscious guilt. Okay. Spirituality is for those who face it. Okay, the purpose of religion is to prevent you from having um, a spiritual experience. The purpose of religion is to prevent you from healing, right? Religion is regarded by the people as true and by the rulers as useful. Okay, so there it is there by Seneca, some ancient Roman guy, I guess, right? Religion is a tool for pillage because religion promotes uh, repression. When there's repression, you're going to project your unconscious guilt onto others and say, oh, others are no good. That creates the us and them. So religion does that. Religion is the, is, the, is, is the means of creating the psychological uh, phenomena of the prejudiced personality. Religion wants to create prejudice in order to pillage. Right? So that's why he said it's useful. Religion is an insult to human dignity. Okay. So we're talking about the perpetrators. Now the victims of religion, uh, they're going to use religion for rescue fantasy. So that's understandable. If they're suffering and uh, billions of people live on $60 a day, uh, they're suffering. So they may use religion at, at, for the rescue fantasy of being reunited with the good mother. Uh, so, so inventing a good mother and projecting it onto the sky. Uh, and then, So they're, com they're using religion as a defense mechanism. Uh, to comfort themselves. So it's sort of understandable on the victim side. But the perpetrators are using it uh, to create poverty, to get them to do the, all of the work. Right? But in general, religion is an insult to human dignity. With or without it, you'd have loved people doing good things and unloved people doing bad things. But for good people to do bad things, it takes religion. Okay? So let's say a baby is loved, but then he's sent into the school system and then into the religious system. It can condition him to think in us versus them, in an us versus them way. Now the poor child is shaking his head. What are you talking about? Uh, he feels loved. Others are loved. He's okay. Others are okay. But he's being conditioned. He's being brainwashed to think that, no, he's okay and others are not okay. So religion is a, a conditioning avenue as well. right? If... If uh, somehow some children ended up with a tolerant personality, religion is meant to take that away, put it, put it, put it that way.
right? You don't need religion to have morals. If you can't determine right from wrong, then you lack empathy, not religion. Religion is the organization of spirituality into something that became the handmaiden of conquerors. Nearly all religions were brought to people and imposed on people by conquerors and used as the framework to control their minds. Okay, religion is mind control. Okay, man is certainly stark mad. He can't make a worm, and yet he'll be making gods by the dozens. Okay. <laughs> Religion questions, sorry, philosophy questions, psychology, philosophy, okay, questions that which may never be answered, but religion answers that which may never be questioned. You see, so there's the extreme attitudes. Us, the, we good, you bad. You don't question, right? So religion gives you these fixed, uh, rigid answers, right? Okay, religion is legalized madness. Okay. Mm -hmm. Religion is one of the phases of thought through which the world is passing. Okay, so. Right. So when humans, grow, when homo sapiens grow up, grow up they'll we'll, we'll go back to spirituality. Right. Spirituality is I'm okay, you're okay. See, religion, despite what they may say, religion doesn't promote, I'm okay, you're okay. They may proclaim it, but they're promoting repression. The effect of religion is, I'm, not okay, I'm okay, you're not okay, or I'm not okay, you're not okay. Religion is to promote splitting. Okay? To, sp to have the effect of splitting. Never mind what they superficially say. Okay, organized religion is responsible for the brainwashing of millions of young children too young to know the difference between reality and the fantasies of millions. Okay, so children are impressionable, right? Every religion is true on the inside when understood metaphor metaphorically. Okay? So, myths and fairy tales are true on the inside, not on the outside, right? Okay, but we get stuck with our own metaphors, confusing them as facts. Right. Okay, knowledge of perinatal dynamics is essential for any serious approach to such problems as mysticism, rites of passage, shamanism, religion, etc. He's saying, you know, when some person says they had a religious exp religious experience, he's talking about he had he re he somehow managed to recreate the fusion with the breast mother. He recreated. He somehow regressed to where he could feel the fusion with the breast mother. Now, if somebody never had a positive experience with the breast mother, they may have that. They may want to recreate that in their fantasy. And then they call that a religious experience. That's what they mean. So you have to understand prenatal trauma, birth trauma. Okay. Um, religion is the masterpiece of the art of behavioral conditioning, for it trains people as to how they shall think. Religion is just mind control. Right. Religion is the possibility of the removal of every ground of confidence, except confidence in, okay, uh, the fantasy. Our religion, so that's the moral defense. So, confidence in the moral defense. The moral defense by the baby is that he has to think that the mother's good, to have the attachment. To survive, the baby must hallucinate that the mother's good, so he can... That's how he can grow up, how he can continue. If the baby were to accept the reality that the mother's rejecting and unloving, he couldn't, he couldn't handle that anxiety. So the moral defense, all defense mechanisms deal with anxiety. The moral defense, religion is a defense mechanism. 
Religion is a defense mechanism. So you create this fantasy that there's some super divine being that's all good. That's a replay of the baby needing to think that the mother's all good to, to survive, right? Because in other words, the moral defense and religion have a lot in common. Okay, um, religion is a crutch that is shackled to you. One you never really needed in the first place, but were convinced by others that you couldn't live without it. Once you discover it's only an illusion, that is not a real crutch, you discard it gladly. Freedom! So if you want emotional freedom, let go of the crutch. If you want emotional freedom, let go of this. <laughs> Ironically, right? Defense mechanisms help the baby to survive their childhood, but after the age of five, these immature defense mechanisms block your development. They take away your emotional freedom. They block emotional freedom. Okay. So the baby needed the crutch. Okay. But after the age of five, this crutch okay, uh, becomes a barrier. Okay. So religion is this barrier. If you drop the religion, um, if you can, if you're ready to do so, uh, you'll find emotional freedom but people are afraid of emotional freedom because they still are holding on to the masochistic bond to the rejecting mother and they're not aware of it so if you're aware of it that when you felt unloved you're attached to your own bl false belief that you're punishing yourself when in reality it was the mother was unavailable so we have to forgive the mother okay the work of healing to get emotional freedom is to forgive the mother to forgive her do research about her interview her find out about her childhood then things start to make sense you see okay all religion my friend is simply evolved out of fraud fear greed imagination and poetry okay <laughs> All religion, my friend, is simply evolved out of fraud, fear, greed, imagination, and poetry. Maybe I'll just take another little stretch here. How's the how's it outside here? Yeah. Okay. It's clearing up a little bit. Okay, so we'll do one last quote here. This is also on religion. Um, people are not going to like this one, but um, <laughs> but it's a quote. I'll pass it along for consideration. I'll pass it along as a question mark because I'm not sure about it myself. But apparently, the theory is that long ago. Long ago, for thousands of years, people believed that the winter solstice, that term means the sun stands still. People long ago believed that the shortest day, um, it was blurred for them. They thought, geez, the shortest day is really four days from the 21st to the 24th. They thought it was just the sun stood still. They didn't have the scientific knowledge about the, the tilt of the, the, the axis and how far it is from the sun. and They didn't know these things too well. So for thousands of years, people thought that the days began to become longer. The sun was out for a longer period of time. That began on the 25th. So the 25th of December uh, was the day uh, when the sun... Uh, started to reemerge. The days were longer. So for thousands of years, winter solstice was um, celebrated on the 25th. 
And someone even said in the ancient Roman calendars, it said the 25th is the winter solstice. Now when Seneca and these guys, or these Roman emperor, emperors, um, when the first empire, they co-opted that you know, when they invented religion and they associated themselves with gods. So they co-opted themselves. Remember, they thought they were gods, remember? So they co-opted that day as their day. And the coins had pictures of them and the sun. And thing. I don't know the details about it, but, um, but for thousands of years, people thought that winter solstice was December 25th. Now we know it's the December 21st. Uh, but they thought it was from the 21st um, um, to the 24th. Yeah. So ironically, um, if you want to celebrate the new sun, the rise of the new sun, you should, you should do it on the 22nd, according to this. Right? But they didn't know that. They, they thought the sun stood still. That's what, that's what the term means. The sun stands still from the 21st to the 24th. They didn't see that. They didn't recognize. They couldn't time it. Is, it an ex is the sun up for an extra minute or two minutes? Now what about on this day? Well, it seems the same. They couldn't tell. So they thought the sun stood still for those four days. Now it's like two minutes. On the 21st, on the 22nd, it's an extra two minutes, they say. And then on the 23rd, another two minutes and so on. So the sun, so the sun started to rise um, right, on the twenty, uh, on the fifth. They thought, right. So religion is the co-opting of winter solstice. Put it that way. Okay. So here's the quote: The twenty-fifth of December is, as we know, the day of the winter solstice. Now this quote is a lot, this is an old, old, this, this guy was writing over a hundred years ago. So maybe a hundred years ago, a lot of people thought that as well. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, the shortest day is past and the sun seems, as it were, to be new. So this day, this Natalis Solus Invinci, Okay, new sun, invincible, right? Is the birthday of the unconquered one, the sun. Okay, the sun is, uh, you, you can't conquer the sun. It's always going to come up on the 25th. So he means the seeming appearance or, quote, birth of a new sun. Okay, so all this time, Okay, I won't comment more on it, um, but something to think about. Let's, let's put it this way. Let's, let's do some more research about winter solstice. Let's get the truth about it. You have to dig into it. I'm sure, it got, I'm sure that information is, has been uh, confused. I did a quick search and I thought, oh my goodness, this is all confused. No one even knows what winter solstice is. Now, Jekylls, he's sort of a, a big name in the psychoanalytic community. Uh, Edmund Burglar gives high praise to Jekylls. Now, if Edmund Burglar gives high praise to Ludwig uh, Jekylls, uh, I think I'm going to include I'm going to include this quote. Burglar is one of our mentors, so. <laughs> and they even had the phrase that on the, on the calendar, that December 25th is the new sun arises, it's invincible, okay? Now you can think that if you're some emperor, you're gonna co-opt that for yourself and get people to think that you're the invincible, and then later on it change. Okay, so again, the theory is that um, in order to pillage, you need to um, invent religion. Right? Uh, religion means one side good, one side bad. Us, them. Right? So religion promotes us, them. Okay, that promotes prejudice. So this, so this feeds. So this sociological side of things feeds into our main thread on the psychology of prejudice.
Now I feel I have mixed feelings about this last one here. That's why I saved it to the end. So I'll have to update that one. Um, so we're not meaning any disrespect here. Um, it's a time for family, of course. It's a wonderful time. Um, but why not celebrate the new sun? Why not just celebrate, you know, or why not celebrate the family get together? Why not celebrate the family and the time together with the, with the family? Why, why, why use that day to promote prejudice, you know, or why use that day? Because the rescue fantasy, okay, the rescue fantasy, yeah, you know, co-opting, confusing the rising of the sun and mixing that in with some rescue fantasy. So use, so creating the rescue fantasy, that means you're not being aware that you're using the rescue fantasy. You're not being aware of what it means to use the rescue fantasy, okay? What it means to use the rescue fantasy means you're not aware of unconscious guilt. Now, when you're not aware of unconscious, so the rescue fantasy me makes you unaware of unconscious guilt. Now, if you're unaware of unconscious guilt, you're going to be unaware of psychodynamics, of projection, and so on. And projection leads to prejudice. So the rescue fantasy promotes prejudice, ironically. And then the victims, right? They think, wait a minute. They think they think they're good and we're not okay. We're not okay. Well, they're gonna of course say, well, we're okay. But them thinking, but them thinking we're not okay. Well, there's something wrong with them. And see how it snowballs. So the victims are gonna say, well, we're okay. And I guess there's something wrong with them. Well, they're not okay. And then it snowballs. And then see, so religion promotes splitting. You see, so that's the idea around that. Okay, I promised you a song about emotional freedom. So, um, everybody knows this song. But, uh, so the song Aretha Franklin called Think. She says here, Hey, uh, boyfriend, I'd like you to think. I want you to free associate. Let your mind go. Right? Meaning, um, just speak freely. Speak what comes to mind. Let yourself be free. S speak freely. Okay? Now, let's go back. Let's go way on back to when you couldn't have been much more than 10. Now, I ain't no psychiatrist. Okay? <laughs> but it don't take too many high IQs to see what you're doing to me. Okay? So this song... The wife, so the girlfriend is saying to her boyfriend, look, boyfriend, could you do some self-reflection? Could you do some free association? I'd like you to think. Pause and think. Free associate. Let your mind go. What You're saying this. What does that remind you of? Now you're saying this. What does this remind you of? Take it back to when you were 10. Aha. Something happened when you were 10, when you were a child. Now, now, I'm not a therapist. I'm not skilled in this. But I can see that you're projecting something from your past into the present. And you're restricting me. You're, you're frightening me. Now, I want emotional freedom. Now, if you withdraw your projection, if you withdraw the transference, if you own the projection, then I'll feel freer in this relationship and I'll have freedom. Now, that's what she means, I think. Right? If you, if you think about the context of this again, Think. Let your mind go. Let yourself be free. Let's go way on back when you couldn't have been too much more than 10. Now, I ain't no psychiatrist. It don't take too much high IQs to see what you're doing to me. Okay? So, the guy is blaming her for something. The guy is projecting or seeing um, his uh, difficult mother onto his girlfriend. That's what he's doing to her. And she wants freedom from this. She wants emotional freedom from this. Okay. So I thought, I thought this would be a good song to add to our collection here.
<laughs> See what she says. She's saying to her boyfriend, look, uh, we want to get along here. Um, you know, I, she likes him and he likes her. And, but he, he's making things difficult. He's projecting his refusing mother onto her and it's restricting her. And she's losing her joy in the relationship. She wants freedom to freedom to love the guy. So he, he, she's encouraging him to think, to free associate. Take it back to when you were a child. What happened when you were a child? Be aware of it. Think. Free associate. So I think, I think this song, my take on this song is that she's talking about, could you please free associate? Um, see, when you free associate, the idea is that you're going to get some memories. Right? If you feel safe and you free associate, you're going to get some memories. Oh, I learned this and I'm stuck there and I'm trying to get a better outcome. So I'm transferring that past pain into the present. Now the girlfriend says, look, I'm not your bad mother. I wasn't there when you were 10. She even says it in the line there. I wasn't there when you were 10. It wasn't me that was there. Right? She even, I think she says it there. Yeah. Let's try again. <laughs> and um you know um i looked it up um the background singers two of them are her sisters but one of them is um whitney houston's mother is one of the background singers i didn't know about her so i did a quick search she, she passed away this month and then no, nobody reported it so i thought um why don't we play one of her songs uh so this is whitney houston's mother uh a good singer in her own right Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, she was the, they say she was the background singer for Elvis Presley and uh, and her, her daughter, of course, and uh, Aretha Franklin and a lot of big names. Uh, Diane War Warwick. Right? Um, so I thought um, on the theme of songs, um, <laughs> I'll play one more. <laughs> so Diana Ross has a new song. That's pretty good, so I thought I'd play that as well. We played one of her songs, a very good song called Thank You. She was saying thank you about things. So here's another uh, new song of hers. So I'll just end up, I'll play this in the background then. So, um, okay. Um, so by the way, yeah, so the song is called Beautiful Love. Right? From, her, from her new album, uh, Thank You, right? Okay, so thanks very much. This has been TQ 1705 to um, 1725. We've added a few quotes um, to a couple of our threads here, mainly on uh, unconscious guilt, a uh, difficult topic here. Um, Ibsen's dictum, if you're writing, you're going to face some of this stuff, right? Burglar says that a true writer faces his unconscious guilt. Burglar says a lot of writers use writing as a defense mechanism to not face their unconscious guilt. He calls these writers, you know, mediocre writers. Um, he calls them hacks, I think. Um, and those writers who are using writing as a defense mechanism, sometimes they get blocked because it's coming up. Burglar says um, to them, well, I'm going to tell you why the block is there. So you'll get your freedom. What you do with it is up to you, of course. And then some writers think, oh, that's what the block is about. Then his writing becomes more deeper and richer if he goes that way, right? If he picks up the golden feather. Right? Now, some writers uh, don't want to go back to the old way. So they give up writing and they can't, they can't face it. Right? And he, Burglar has this theory about, um, no, I'll save it, okay. Um, okay, yeah, well, the Injustice Collector. So this metaphor is the repetition compulsion of, re of re repeating the original rejection from the mother and doing it again and again. He calls that person the Injustice Collector. Right? So he ends up as a curmudgeon, right? Yeah, judge for the defense. If a, if a child's unloved, he takes refuge in the grandiose part self. And his energy is to preserve that grandiose self, to feel important. All he wants to do is feel important. Whatever it is, he just wants to feel important that he makes it happen. It's about him. He, he, he's lost uh, touch with his true self. Yeah. Adler says that people with an inferiority complex compensate with a superiority complex. He means taking refuge in the grandiose part self. That's what he means, right? The group therapy one. He says he doesn't want to attend a group. He doesn't want to sit in a circle because it might remind him of his family scene. Interpretation seeks to bring out the latent meaning of the subject's words and behavior. Its aim is to reveal. Hold on. Why don't we. Uh... I think those are her two best songs from that new album. Thank you, and this one here. Oh! <laughs> she, she loves the listener. That's nice. Okay. Um... I'll play our theme song. I'll play our theme song in the background. Katja Epstein's um, German rendition of the song Windmills of the Mind. 
This series, 1001 Windmills of the Mind, is named after this song. Can't you see that your subconscious attitude toward yourself is consciously directed at others? You have a contempt for yourself, even a loathing. You think you're not worthy of love, hence you've withdrawn into a shell. You blame yourself for the rejection you felt as a child. You have come to expect this rejection from everyone. You divorce yourself from people because you look down upon yourself and can't believe that they could accept you and offer you love. But you discovered in the past sessions that your childhood rejection was not of your making, that you had no control over it, that it was caused by many factors not involving you. Why continue to blame yourself or judge people today by the emotional judgments of your childhood? The emotional judgments of her childhood is that she punished herself, that she thought she punished herself because she thought the mother was him, was her. That's a mistake, right? That's what we have to correct, right? So we face our defense mechanisms around this. When we face our, when we recognize that our defense mechanisms are our resistance, that's a victory. That's what he means here. Interpretation seeks to bring out the latent meaning of a subject's words and behavior. Its aim is to reveal unconscious desires and the defensive conflicts linked to them. The goal is the lifting, the primary goal of interpretation is the lifting of resistance. The cure is not the result of premature recognition of whatever has been repressed, but occurs through a victory over the resistance of the source of the it, it occurs through a victory over the resistances as the source of this ignorance. Okay. Right? The cure occurs through a victory over the resistances as the source of this ignorance. There it is. The cure. Okay? The goal of 1001 windmills of the mind as well. It seeks to find a victory over the resistances, the defense awareness of the use of our defense mechanisms. Okay? A victory over the resistances of the source, of the source, as the source of this ignorance. I think there's a typo in here. Again, the cure <laughs> occurs through a victory over the resistances as the source of this ignorance, right? Our ignorance, right? This false belief that we're guilty, right? Our ignorance, our unawareness of that, there's a resistance to it. If we, the cure is if we can overcome this resistance, there it is, right? Okay, again. Okay, one about the Imago. The baby thinks thinks in images, goddess and demon, that's not reality. That's a sign of trauma. Right. So we wanna bring those two images together to create a reality, a more realistic image of the mother as an ordinary person. Not perceive others in our un out of our unconscious way of thinking. Remember, the unconscious has a different system than the conscious. Right? So we want to heal the internal object relations world. 
internal object relations world is meant to be there's a concept of the self that's whole and a concept of the other that's whole that's whole object relations so we want to move from split part object relations to whole object relations right from persecutory anxiety to depressive anxiety from the paranoid schizoid position to the depressive position right now this again this normally happens when the love outweighs the frustration so man's main task is to sort this out for himself. Man's main task is to give psychological birth to himself. Right? So we want to sort this out. Right? So we are being our own existential detective. We all have to be our own therapist, right? right? Now you don't need high IQs for it, like the song says. Right? Projection is a mirror. Right? Our repetition compulsion, our behavior, that's a mirror. Right? Our attitudes, that's a mirror. Cynicism is a mirror. Cynicism gratifies the grandiose part self. So, so, do it, so engaging and noticing yourself being so cynical, that's a mirror for a person to see that they're taking refuge in their infantile megalomania. Infantile megalomania is meant to be lost at the age of 18 months. So if they're still using that, that means they have trauma. Yeah? So that's the mirror. So then we forgive the mother. In the process, we understand ourselves. Then we go through the mourning process. So the goal is to go through the mourning process. It takes 20 years, they say, from 40 to 60 on average. If you have the money, you fly to New York, you, you find a guy like this guy, and you can do it in two and a half years, right? If you can find a guy like that, you know? Okay, and we ended up with a couple of quotes to our thread on the psychology of religion. And winter solstice is coming up, right? So I'll end it here. So thanks very much. Um, we'll be adding more quotes to our different threads. Thanks again. Bye for now.